I'm interested. Class test one last year, um, the average mark was two and a half out of 15. Sorry, I've got to turn that down for some reason. So I was pretty keen to have the average result better than that this year. Hang on. Ah. Doesn't matter. Go. That'll do. Good, good. So pretty keen. So not many people left early. How to do with time? Rushed? Okay. But you got to all three questions. Good. Better than last year. How do you guys go with the exam? No. Complete no. Okay. Right. We'll have to see how it comes out in the wash. Yellow or blue? Okay. There's a problem with the yellow paper. I'm not sure how to... Question two. All right. Um, but... Let's talk about our lecture for today, and we'll get to that. I'll start with this, because it's cool. So, hey. So thank you for your, um, thank you for your patience. <laughs> Yay. Those guys are the star of the show. Um, he's sleeping there. Don't get the wrong impression. Last night he didn't sleep very well. The night before that he didn't sleep very well. Um, Samuel looks happy there. Don't get the wrong impression. He's a bit grumpy about having a younger brother. <laughs> but uh, in general, it's, it's working out very well. So thank you for your patience. Uh, I watched John Olson's lecture. I thought he did uh, um, admirable treatment of the things that he did. So thanks um, for letting him do his thing. Uh, today, I'm going to cover, so my, my hope is to get auto cycles. All right, that's my, um, my dream. We'll see what happens with timing. But first of all, I want to talk about thermodynamic cycles. Uh, why are we talking about cycles? The, the course transitions significantly from everything that happens before class test one to now talking about second law of thermodynamics, which John started on, I'll, I'll try and continue on as well. Um, and cycles, this is where we wanted to get to, but we had to learn the other stuff first. So I want to introduce thermodynamic cycles. The auto cycle is a cycle. That's where we're trying to get to. Um, I think we haven't formally defined thermal efficiency, so I want to do that as well, so we know when we, there's a couple of different efficiency terms used in the subject. So thermal efficiency is the first one we'll talk about. And when I just retouch on Carnot cycle, we'll talk about second law efficiency as well. So I want to, I want to touch on those things. Uh, we talked about the Carnot cycle for a, um, a heat engine. John covered that. Sorry, I should call him Dr. Olson, because, you know, uh, but I call him John. The Carnot cycle can also be applied to refrigerators and heat pumps, so I want to uh, just cover those as well. And then, if we're doing very well, we'll get to the auto cycle. There's no need to rush. We're doing quite well for course content coverage over the session. So we're doing well. Um, were there any questions that came up from Dr. Olson's lecture before the break? You've just had a mid-session break. Uh, you've had a class test. Oh yeah, I should, I should mention the yellow paper. Okay. Um, normally, because I like to be diligent with this sort of thing, um, I do the tests before you guys do the tests to make sure they can be done. And that seems like a diligent, uh, appropriate thing to do. Um, it's been a distracted fortnight, uh, as you can see. So I did the tests while you guys did the tests. Because I had five invigilators, I'm like, ah, you, you know, no one's, no one's cheating, you're all good. Um, so I was up the front typing out the solutions while you were doing the solutions. Um, for what it's worth, I completed both papers uh, in, in the 40 minutes that I gave myself. <laughs> so, um, but you know, whatever. So I did the blue paper first, then I did the yellow paper. The questions were similar, but they had slightly different numbers. When I did the yellow paper, I discovered to my chagrin that uh, what I described, a spring with uh, some saturated, a saturated mixture 
that then goes to a higher pressure and a higher temperature. I thought that will all work. It'll expand slightly. Uh, when you actually do the specific volume calculations, it compresses under the, under the force of the spring, right? Um, which means mechanically it doesn't work, although mathematically it still does. So what I'm doing with the marking of that is if you did the math and, it, and you solved the math, even though it mechanically doesn't work, full marks, no worries, not a problem. Um, if you had some sort of comment in your thing, so you did the math on the specific volumes and went, hang a minute, this is no good, all right? I want to acknowledge that and give you marks as well, okay? So I'll be talking specifically, we're working with a mark of that question very closely and trying to make sure you're not disadvantaged for having an accurate understanding of how that should physically work. My bad, I should have gone down with the pressure. Um, I should have done the test beforehand. There was only 15 minutes left. I should have said, change it from 20% quality to 2% quality, then it would have worked. Um, but that would have stuffed people up. So my bad, I'll make sure that my mistake, I'll really try to endeavor to make sure my mistake doesn't disadvantage you um, if you had the yellow paper. So hopefully you wrote some comments there, followed your understanding through. Um, that's me. I was tearing up about it last night and I'm like, if I stay awake, I won't lecture well. <laughs> cool. Questions, comments, thoughts, go. Uh, Good. On a case-by-case -case basis, I'll look through them. In a large cohort, you generally find people follow one of a few different solution paths, and so we'll, we'll judge the value of each of the solution paths that students followed, and say, yep, that, I think it's, the question's marked out of five. We'll say, yep, we can see what the student's doing there. We're gonna, we'll allocate marks based on that. I, that's the best I can do. I'm sorry. But you won't be unique in following a solution path, which say, yeah, has it got thermodynamic merit? Are they demonstrating good thinking? And we'll assess it based on that. Um, yep, that's what it is. All right, cool, good. Let's lecture then. Yes, go, Chris. Thank you for your tip on the microphone. Should have told me earlier. Go. John, this, the, this PowerPoint isn't on Moodle already, no. Um, I'm getting there. Cool, good, good. All right. No. Anyway, whatever. Cool. So, thermodynamic cycles. Let's talk about them. As I said, we're transitioning there. I want to mention the assignment um, as well when we mention thermodynamic cycles. Basically, up until now, we've been looking at individual processes or two processes, one, one after the other. Something's compressed and heat is added, question three. Right? Or um, heat is added and something's moving. Right? So you're doing the thermodynamic analysis on a process rather than a cycle. And processes are good. If you've got hot compressed gas, then you can do work with that and you get something out of it. But basically, we need to do that lots of times. You don't get enough work to just say, well, that's the end of, this, that's the end of that device, let's go. So what we do is we do things lots of times. Right? So we have a hot compressed gas, and then we expand it, get the work out, and then we have to re-put ourselves back in the same configuration. So the devices we care about are ones that do this again and again and again. We will only analyze devices at steady state operating conditions, although you could do this for startup, just introduce some transient um, variables. We won't go there because it's, um, it's not nice mathematically. So steady state, steady flow is the kind of assumption that we'll do. And the bottom point, which I've mentioned before, and I want to re-mention now, is that because the whole cycle is closed, and because whatever you do to the gas, wherever it goes, when you come back to the point of the cycle that you start analyzing it, the cyclic integral of any property equals zero. So if you start at 25 degrees and then that temperature goes up and then goes up again, then comes down, then goes down again, the temperature at the start of the cycle has to be 25 degrees. If you start with an enthalpy of 1,200 kilojoules per kilogram, the enthalpy after the whole cycle has to be the same. 
Right? So the properties return to the same value at any point of analysis through the cycle. You say, well, what's the point of the cycle? Well, work and heat aren't properties. So the cyclic integral of work and the cyclic integral of heat aren't zero after the whole cycle. Okay? So even though the fluid is returning back to its, the same uh, property state, uh, we are either putting work in or getting heat out or vice versa. Um, and so that's the value of these things. We're going to analyze six real cycles. So to put six cycles, there's seven here. Um, but the Carnot is just a, uh, a hypothetical cycle. All right. So Carnot cycles what Dr. Olson did with you in week five. And I just want to retouch on that in my format so you get the feel for the format I'll follow. This follows the idea that we've got two different types of fluid. We've got ideal gases, okay, lots of equations, you know, PV to the n equals C, uh, PV on T equals PVT, that sort of thing. Right, ideal, um, change in enthalpy is CP, delta T, that sort of thing, right? So ideal gases, lots of equations. Um, pure substances, lots of looking up tables. Lots of uh, interpolating. Um, change in enthalpy can occur without a change in temperature if you've got an enthalpy of uh, uh, boiling and so forth. Right, so pure substances. And then there's two reasons that we might use a thermodynamic cycle. One are called power cycles. Right? So this is exploiting a difference in temperature to create work or power. So thermodynamics, we're talking about heat and we're talking about work. So you've got something hot and something cold hot reservoir, cold reservoir, um, and instead of just touching them together and letting heat transfer happen, you put a cycle in between them and you exploit the fact that heat wants to flow through that to generate a work output, okay, power cycle. So in the air standard power cycle, okay, you've got the spark ignition engine, you've got the compression ignition engine, and you've got the gas turbine engine. And there's two different variants of the gas turbine engine um, that have different specialities and we'll talk about that when we get there. Power cycle in the pure substance, we start thinking about a thermal power plant. So this is your, your coal-fired steam power plant, how we get most of our electricity in New South Wales. It can be solar, thermal, it can be um, nuclear. Right? The fuel source, this, our treatment of it is agnostic to the fuel source, or the, the source of heat, but um, we th I, th I usually think coal fire, because that's what I'm used to. The other thing we can do is we can use work to create a, a flow of heat against the normal temperature gradient. So it can move heat from a cold space to a warm space. Never happens spontaneously on its own. You put them together, heat flows from the hot to the cool. Um, but if we put work in, then we can either have a heat pump um, or a refrigerator. They're the same device, but you, you want a different outcome. And so there's two ways we can do that with, a, with an ideal gas. We can do what's called the reverse Brayton cycle. So Brayton was the gas turbine engine. So you can reverse a gas turbine engine, or you can do the vapor compression refrigeration, which is sometimes called a reverse Rankine cycle. So running the Rankine with a different, um, putting work into the turbine instead of taking work out. So those are the six cycles then that we're gonna treat in this subject and in the assignment, which I'll release soon, you're invited to pick a real world device based on one of those cycles and analyze it, what's its published data on its output. So say for example, an engine, right? They'll sell you what the torque is at an RPM. And so you analyze the auto cycle, in this case, say it's a petrol engine, you would analyze the auto cycle according to what we'll learn in class then you'll look at the published data from the manufacturer and you'll say, oh, we should be getting more power than we are. Why is that? And we kind of look at uh, the real world application of these things. I don't want to lose the fact that this is the background for real things that affect our lives. The air conditioner, which may or may not be on. We'll see. Um, air conditioning, let's just check it. It's running, excellent. The air conditioner, uh, the bus you rode in on because no one drives to uni, who can afford the parking? Um, the, thing, you know, the, the power station that's powering the lights. When we talk about 
cycles, they're all simplified and idealized. And that's just the nature of how we have to treat them. And that's why I want you to look at a real world device and comparing with the treatment we give, because I want you to know that it's simplified. Uh, these aren't the only cycles that exist. When I did thermodynamics, and I won't tell you how long ago that was, as an undergrad, um, I learned the same six cycles, for what's worth, and I've never worked with an auto cycle, a diesel cycle, a Rankine cycle. Um, oh, I've seen Rankine cycles in action, but they certainly weren't simplified Rankines like what we'll learn. Right? But the idea is that by analyzing these cycles, when you come to something that is thermodynamic in the workforce, then you go, oh yeah, okay, I can see heat's being added here, the pressures are doing this. Oh, yep, yeah, okay, I understand what's going on. So it's more, if you understand these six, then you can be presented with something new and, um, and not look like a fool when you're talking with your colleagues about it, basically. Um, no, there's stories, I won't tell them. Um, but like an understanding of thermodynamics, right? So you propose a thought and it's thermodynamically impossible, all right, it just, it, it reduces your credibility. Uh, so that's what we'll, we'll do, we'll do these six cycles. Um, we also only do pure substances, and I guess that's the other part of the story. Like in reality, there's lots of mixtures. The principles are the same. So you, you learn what you learn here, and then you extract out the principles. When we solve cycles, I thought you'd be interested, so you should do this in your PSS sessions as well though. Um, we are interested in what the properties of the fluid are at each of the state points. So at state point one, it's got this pressure, this temperature, this enthalpy, this entropy, you know, whatever. Then at state point two, it's got this other pressure, pressure temperature, whatever, right? And so what we do is we draw a big table and we say state point one, state point two, state point three, state point four, et cetera, ad nauseum. And we say temperature, pressure, specific volume, entropy, whatever properties that you think are relevant. And the temperature here is 25 degrees, 100 degrees. You don't use degrees, use Kelvin, but you know, 300 degrees, so forth. All right, so we fill out a, a table, um, or we just, we draw the state table initially that we will put in properties for. Uh, we write down the properties that we know. We write down other givens, so things that we're gonna use to solve the problem. Uh, we write down our assumptions, which are important. So you need to know if the question says adiabatic or not. Um, fill out the state table and then basically m the way that most of these problems go, such as we analyze them, is you'll be asked for something. What's the net power out of the system? What's net heating? What's the thermal efficiency? Um, what's the required mass flow rate? So you're asked various things that are basically um, plus and minus or generally minus operations within the properties you develop in the state table. So if it looks complicated, this is what we're doing. We do it um, a lot of times. You just need to be aware of what the different assumptions are for the different cycles. So that's what we're doing. That's where the course is transitioning to, six cycles. Um, and I just want to retouch on Meccano in a few different ways. Any questions about cycles, where we're going? Excellent, good. Cool. So. Thermal efficiency, I just want to formally uh, define thermal efficiency. It's one of the efficiencies we'll talk about. Uh, the implications of the first law for a closed system, which I've said before, but I want to restate it. Uh, we'll talk about the efficiency of a heat engine, which is what we think of, maybe. So we're exploiting a heat difference to generate power, and also a refrigerator and heat pump. And that's what we'll do. Go, go I say. All right, we know that for a closed process, okay, Q minus W equals delta U. And we know that for a thermodynamic cycle, so by the time you go all the way around, there is no change in U at the end of having gone all the way around the, cy around the cycle, okay? So from that, we get Q, and this is the net. So this is any heat in and heat out equals work, and this is any work in, work out. Okay? So for a heat engine, the more heat you can put into the engine and not lose heat out of the engine, 
the more work you get out. So, and that works on a power basis as well. So that's on a total basis or also on a power basis. Now, Q net, we can have a, an equation for that, is however much heat you put into the system minus however much heat you draw out of the system. And heat comes in at the high temperature and leaves at the low temperature. So this is Q, H and QL, which have been introduced before. In some texts, QL is QC for cold, so high and low, or hot and cold. And work net is work out minus work in. You'll often have to put work into a cycle to get it started. And so the work net is the heat in minus the heat out, which is not necessarily intuitive. And you know, there's some complicated equations relating to work, so for an isentropic and an isothermal process and so forth. You don't need those if you know the heat in and the heat out. So you don't need to do crazy integrals to work out what your, your net work is. You just say, well, how much heat am I putting into the system? How much heat am I taking out? The rest must be coming out as work. So that can simplify our, um, our solutions somewhat. When we talk about efficiency, I think of efficiency as being the thing that you want out divided by the thing you have to put in. Um, so what do we want out of a heat engine, for example? I've said at least three times this lecture. Work. work, yep, so you want work out of a heat engine. What do you want out of a refrigerator? I'll talk about heat pump soon. Strangely, you don't want heat out, but that's okay. What do you want? What's the flow that you're measuring as being a good result? It gets cold, that's good. Yep, so the heat out of the cold space is what you measure as what you want out of the refrigerator. Um, heat pump. Um, over in Western Australia, it's not, I haven't seen any in New South Wales. But over in WA, when I lived over there, uh, my place over there has a heat pump water heater. Okay? So if you've got a normal electrical water heater, then you've got an insulated tank with an electrical wire running in it that curls around a bit and then comes back out, and you run current through the wire. It makes the wire hot, and that heats the water up. Okay, and so if you put a kilowatt of, you know, a kilowatt of uh, electricity through the wire, you lose that through the resistance in the wire, then the water has a kilowatt of energy added to it and it gets hotter. Right? So that's a normal way to do things. Very simple construction and it has an efficiency of one or close to and loses some heat through the insulation. They're slightly warm. If you've got one at home, touch the outside, it's slightly warm. Gas is somewhat similar. You burn a gas and it's, um, it makes it hot. My heater over in WA is a heat pump heater. And so what that is, is it's like a refrigerator bolted to the outside of my, um, uh, my water tank, right? It draws in atmospheric air. It makes the atmospheric air colder and spits it back out. So when you feel it, it feels cold. And the heat that it extracts from the air is what it puts into the water, as well as the electrical power that it consumes goes into the water. And so it can be two or three times more efficient than a standard uh, resistance-based water heater. It's more expensive um, to build, because a wire is really cheap, but a refrigerator is more expensive. So it's more expensive to build, maybe more parts to break, um, but the promise is higher efficiency, and particularly in Western Australia, where you've got lots of ambient heat in the air, particularly over summer, to exploit, um, heat pumps are a great idea. Uh, so the things we want out, of a heat engine, we want out, we want work out of that. A heat pump, the thing we want out of a heat pump is the hot space to get hotter, and the thing we want out of a refrigerator is for the cold space to get colder. And what do we put into them? Into a heat engine, we put a, a thermal difference, a difference in temperatures, and into a heat pump and a refrigerator, we put work. So into a heat engine we put Q, and into a heat pump and refrigerator we put work. The efficiency then of a heat engine, so eta efficiency, is the work that we get out of it divided by the heat we have to put into it. Um, 
which we know the work we put in is the work that goes into the hot space minus uh, the, sorry, the heat that goes into the hot space minus the heat that comes out of the cold space. And so we can develop an expression for efficiency. Remembering efficiency is what we want is work, but we've developed it entirely in terms of heat. So this is our heat for a heat engine. Um, for our refrigerator, and it's efficiency, but we'll call it co um, coefficient of performance, and there's a reason we'll do that. What we want out is we want heat to come out of the cold space. So that's what we want. What do we have to put in? We have to put in work. We think about this as putting in electricity into the compressor. Um, but it doesn't have to be electrical energy. You could imagine someone uh, riding a bike or something, so it's just work put into the unit. We can express work in terms of heat, and so we get an expression for the coefficient of performance for a refrigerator, just in terms of the heat in and the heat out. And similarly for a heat pump, and this is, this is on the right-hand side is our depiction of that. So we've got our low temperature reservoir, like the, air, the space inside our fridge. We extract heat out of that. We put work in, and then we reject heat to the hot space. You should be aware that refrigerators um, don't destroy heat. They move it from the inside of the fridge to the outside of the fridge. Uh, in the unit that I'm living in now, someone's installed an air conditioner and we've got like an underground garage with a set of stairs going up. And they put the compressor for the air conditioner on the wall with the fan facing the doorway. And then the stairs go up, right? Heat rises, um, hot air rises. So when they're running their air conditioner, everyone else's units get hotter. It's really annoying. It's like, and, and, and their unit also, because the heat will leak into their unit. Um, if you put a refrigerator in a room with the door open, the room gets hotter. The room doesn't get colder. Um, anyway, whatever. People are personally optimizing and they don't care about other people, um, in my experience. So, it, it should be obvious to, maybe not obvious, but you should be able to see that whatever heat you put in here, plus whatever work you put in here, the sum of those two values, so if this was one unit and this was three units, okay, going into the cycle, then what comes out of the cycle must be four units. So this is kilojoules, kilowatts, megawatts, doesn't matter, right? Because whatever comes in, if this is to be a steady state system, so it's not getting hotter over time or colder over time, then for energy balance to, for energy not to be created or destroyed, okay, what comes out must be the sum of those two values. And so in this case, just the coefficient of performance of the refrigerator would be three divided by one. So you get a COP of three in this case. If you wanted this to be a heat pump and what you cared about was making the hot space hotter, then the coefficient of performance would be what you want, which is the four units, divided by what you put into it, which is one unit. So the coefficient of performance of the heat pump would be four in the same situation. So indeed, heat pump, what we want is heat out, oh, sorry, the heat to the hot space, what we have to put in is work. We denote that gamma, and there's an equation for that as well. And we find that, God bless you, two things, one is these efficiencies, what we could call efficiency, are often greater than one. In fact, you don't run a heat pump if you can't get an efficiency greater than one, you just use an electrical resistance wire. And so we call them coefficients of performance. So, because we like to think of efficiency as being a number between zero and one, something we can turn into a percentage. Um, so we don't call them efficiency, we call them coefficient of performance. And we find that the coefficient of performance for any heat pump would be the coefficient of performance of a refrigerator in the same case, plus one. Because you're dividing throughout by work, and for the heat pump case, the work is going into the hot space as well. So we find that we've got an additional unit. Um, and that was the case before. We can see it trivially. If I could get something with five and one there, this must be six, right? So the beta for this system would be five divided by one. The gamma for this system would be six divided by one. The gamma would be one more than the beta. So this is efficiencies, this is thermal efficiencies and thermal coefficients of performance. And there are limits to how efficient you can get. 
um, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the Carnot cycle. Excellent. I feel like the room's quiet. I'm doing lots of talking. You say something now. No, seriously, does anyone want to, want to talk about any of that? Go. Good, excellent. The gamma is the coefficient of performance of a heat pump. So gamma is for the heat pump and beta is for the refrigerator. So refrigerator, freezer, air conditioner that's making things cold. We consider that all to be a refrigeration cycle. Right? Heat pump like my hot water, heat, um, hot water heater, a, air a reverse cycle air conditioner that's making the space hot. Okay, heat pump. Um, so that's thermal efficiency. Eta is efficiency of heat engine. So you're taking hot and cold space and, uh, and producing work or power. Excellent. Carnot cycle, I'm going to flip through this. I just want to show a couple of diagrams. Um, this is already up on the website. I, I put my treatment of the same concepts that John Olson taught last time we got together uh, up as PDFs, just so you've got them. This is a pretty typical question for next week's PSS. Uh, and was question 1A in the final exam last year? Um, although it won't, obviously it won't be this year. Uh, what's the maximum theoretical thermal efficiency of a heat engine, so heat engine, you're trying to get work out, operating between a high temperature reservoir, so a space that maintains the same temperature irrespective of how much heat you draw from it or give to it, and a low temperature reservoir, the temperature is given. Okay? So this is based on the idea of the Carnot cycle, defining for us the maximum thermal efficiency that we can achieve. So you say, oh, the thermal efficiency of my car is 25%. Is that good or bad? Well, how good could it be? Oh, look at that. I, I wonder if Kamel is participating in the lecture. Um, how good could it be if the Carnot efficiency was 40%, 25% starts looking okay. If the Carnot efficiency was 80%, 25% is starting to look like a long way away from ideal. Okay, so that's, that's the question. Um, Carnot imagined a cycle that um, all of the processes were reversible. Okay? Reversible isothermal expansion, reversible adiabatic expansion, reversible isothermal compression, and reversible adiabatic compression. I prefer in pictures. Right? So the idea is that you put heat into the system, so going from left to right, you put heat into the system across an infinitesimally small temperature difference as the cylinder expands. Then you allow the cylinder to expand more. Right? So this is, this is producing work. So work's coming out of this, work's coming out of this. Then you put work in while maintaining the temperature at the cold temperature, and then you put work in further to draw the temperature from the cold temperature back up to the hot temperature, and likewise from the hot temperature to the cold temperature. If that should have been the impression that you got from Dr. Olson's treatment of the subject. So Carnot, um, this temperature difference is, as he said, infinitesimally small in both cases. Uh, from our heat transfer work, we know that heat transfer is proportional to temperature difference. So if you make the temperature difference infinitesimally small, you either need an infinite area of cylinder, infinite surface area, to transmit the heat over, or you need an infinite amount of time. So Carnot's cycle gives you the ideal work per cycle, but it gives you a power of zero, because it's work divided by time, and the time is infinite. So just um, the PV diagram and the TS diagram for the same. The efficiency, which we just saw, the thermal efficiency for any heat engine is 1 divided by Q, uh, 1 minus QC on QH. For Carnot specifically, QC divided by QH is the same as TC divided by TH. That's only true of Carnot and Stirling. The derivation is here. There it is. Oh no, that's TH. There it is. <laughs> You've already been through that math. So for the Carnot, Carnot engine only, 
the Qs can be replaced with Ts, and we get this as the efficiency. So this tells you that if you could reject the heat into a cold space that was at zero Kelvin, for example, then the Carnot efficiency would be 100%. You could, would be perfectly efficient. But in reality, we can only reject heat into uh, spaces that are the temperature that we can see. You can't reject heat, uh, can't reject, uh, heat at a colder temperature than the ambient temperature around you. Um, Lord Kelvin said that. And so sometimes we can't control the lower bound temperature. And so what we try and do is make the upper bound temperature hotter to get more thermally efficient cycles. That is bounded by typically materials. Um, and so, you know, they're talking about um, like ceramic bl turbine blades instead of metal turbine blades because then you can get things hotter. Um, you can get your higher temperature hotter. At some point, it's bounded by the adiabatic flame temperature, which is how hot you can get a fire, depending on the fuel. That gives us something to compare our heat engines to, though. Like I said, if you've got, a, um, if you've got an auto cycle, a, a combustion, you know, internal combustion engine, spark ignition, how hot does it get? What's the cold temperature you're rejecting the heat to? What would Carno say the cycle should be performing at? What are you actually observing? What's your, not only your thermal efficiency, but then your second law efficiency? So what is the maximum efficiency between these two heats? I think I can do it on the, um, one drive. What was the formula? And that's N thermal Carnot. equals 1 minus temperature cold, temperature hot. I've given it in Kelvin, so there's no mucking around. Right. 300 divided by 900. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Okay. So, the beauty of this is knowing nothing other than how hot the hottest point in the cycle gets and how cold the coldest point in the cycle gets. We can work out if you had a perfect heat engine. It, there's nothing wrong with the heat engine. It's, it, it's ideal in every way. Your thermal efficiency is still only 66%. Okay? And this is the attraction of things like solar, photovoltaic solar cells, uh, things like fuel cells, is working with heat really limits your options and limits your efficiencies. Uh, your body has thermodynamic processes in it, okay, but it never goes hot and cold. Right? You're kind of around your 38 degrees. So it, it doesn't use thermal cycles. Um, it gets the energy in and out in other ways. Um, and so uh, the answer there is 66%. And that's then the maximum thermal efficiency. So that gives us a number we can compare to. That's just the kind of cycle that should have been revision for you. Um, largely, all the math is, is in there. Carnot cycle also then defines for us the maximum coefficients of performance for refrigerators and heat pumps. Okay? So the idea is oh, here's, here's a question. Uh, so you're designing a refrigerator for Australian conditions. Do you feel like it might get up to 45 degrees in the kitchen or into the, into the space adjacent to the fridge? Um, and you want to keep your milk cold, and so you're having a low temperature reservoir of 2 degrees. So the question is, what's the Carnot coefficient of performance for a refrigerator based on these temperatures? So how efficient can you be? And then... You find a fridge advertised with a coefficient of performance of four. Is that good? I don't know. Is that close to the Carnot efficiency? Is it not? Uh, how do you know, how does a consumer, or what's the thing that indicates to the consumer the coefficient of performance for a given refrigerator or fridge, freezer, that sort of thing? Star energy rating, right? 
The number of stars relates to the coefficient of performance. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship because you wish it was. I read the standard that defines it, thinking, oh, I could present that to the class. It would be really practical. It's just, it's a horrific read. Um, but it does, it relates. Um, there's a bunch of, bunch of stuff. But the star rating system will give you an indication of the coefficient of performance. And the question is, is the COP of four good? Well, sounds good. Put in one kilojoule of energy, get four kilojoules of energy out of the cold space. Um, so similarly, based on the heat engine, so each process is reversible. Heat's transferred reversibly. That's a fantasy, but that's what we've done. Um, so we, don't, we can't build these in practice, but they give us something to compare to. So for our beta for thermal efficiency, that was our formula from before. For the Carnot cycle only, our ratio of heats equals our ratio of temperatures. We've seen that derivation. So the coefficient of performance for a refrigerator for the Carnot cycle is this formula here. Uh, last year, I would have recommended you memorize this. This year, uh, I'll provide formula sheets. The formula sheet for the final exam would be larger than the formula sheet was for quiz one. Were any of the formulas in the formula sheet useful? There wasn't any interpolation. Anyway. I'm trying, I'm try I can't remember what questions I asked. Isentropic work was useful? Yes, it was. Isentropic work for, the, um, for question three. Excellent, good, good, good. All right, I wrote the formula sheet and then I wrote the questions. Um, anyway. So that's the maximum. It's good. I want, I want you to talk. Um, nothing like a quiz. So that's the, the best thermal efficiency you can have. The heat pump has a similar thermal efficiency. It's one plus whatever the, the beta is uh, for what it's worth. Right, so we get the same relationships as before. Here we're using T's instead of Q's, and that's only true when you deal with a Carnot cycle. For a heat engine, the larger the temperature difference, the higher the efficiency can be. So the larger the ratio of uh, temperatures, so 900 and 300 is a third, okay? So we, we lose a third of what we could produce. Uh, if you could get something that was between 1200 Kelvin and 200 Kelvin, you could get to six, right? You'd lose 16% of the end. You'd have a Carnot efficiency of 84, for example, right? For refrigerators and heat pumps, it's the other way around. So the closer the temperatures are, the higher the coefficient of performance will be, okay? So for example, here, you know, if you get, as TH on TC gets close to one, right, TH is always gonna be higher than TC because it's the hot and the cold, right? So this is always gonna be larger than one, but as it approaches one, this approaches infinity. Same with the heat pump, as this approaches one, so TC is always gonna be less than TH, okay? Um, but as it approaches, as that ratio approaches one, the coefficient of performance approaches infinity as well. So it's harder to move heat between uh, temperature reservoirs that are further apart in temperature. It's easier to move heat between uh, reservoirs that are closer in temperature as a ratio. Um, just something to think about. How do I remember the formulas? I remember that formula. Ah, it's not such a big deal, but I think you should know. I think you should have a sense for what these formulas are, and I think they're worth remembering in any case. Um, I remember it has to be a ratio, and I want this value to between, be between one and zero, okay? So I need one minus, I need this to be something that's less than one, and the way to get the TC and the TH as a ratio to work that's less than one is you put the TC on the top. So I derive all my formulas on the fly as I go. Um, which is why I need lecture notes, because uh, it's awkward to see. The coefficient of performance for a refrigerator is the reciprocal of the coefficient of performance for a heat engine, uh, if you take the absolute value. And then the coefficient of performance for gamma is just beta plus one. 
So that's how I do, when I'm answering these questions, that's how I do, do that. So there's only really one formula to remember, um, and the rest are based on principles. So what is the maximum theoretical thermal efficiency for a refrigerator operating between those reservoirs? Let's have a look. Go here. Oops. Yeah, excellent. Heat pump or refrigerator? Beta or gamma? Votes on beta? Excellent, good, good. All right. Beta equals one on. Yeah, that looks right. On one minus the cold temperature is two plus two seven three point one five. The hot temperature is forty five plus two seven three point one five. I have to go to Kelvin because I'm dealing with a ratio. If I was just um, summing and minusing, or particularly minusing, if I was just taking the difference of two temperatures, I wouldn't need to go into Kelvin. The fact that I'm taking a ratio means that I need to go into Kelvin. And I did this calculation beforehand. It comes out as 6.40. So for every kilojoule of work we put into this refrigerator, in an ideal sense, in the Carnot sense, we would get 6.4 kilojoules of heat out of the cold space. And how much heat would we put into the hot space? Seven point four. Yep, good, good, excellent. So then we say, well, the refrigerator you're buying has a coefficient of performance of four. What's the second law efficiency? And so is four good or bad between these temperatures? There's our thermal efficiency, and we say our second law efficiency, okay, eta second law, is whatever our actual device is operating at, divided by what the Carnot, what Carnot would say that it should be operating at, which is four divided by 6.4, so 62.5%. So you're 62.5% of the way towards an ideal cycle. And we'll get a sense for, and particularly your assignment will give you a sense for, is that good or bad? Right? What, what's the air conditioner in this room operating at in terms of its second law efficiency? How close to Carnot um, are we operating? What's the temperature outside? Co cool day, 25? We're trying to maintain 20 in here. Right? What's the ratio in Kelvin between 25 and 20? A coefficient of performance should be more than 10. What's the air conditioner operating at? I don't know, but you, you can actually... Uh, I haven't seen it for this building, but I went and looked at the condenser units on J17, and it's written on there. The high pressure, the low pressure, what refrigerants it's using. You can Google the refrigerant, get the table data. Right? You can reverse engineer uh, the refrigerator for J17 at least, because you can access the condenser. Um, I assume you can here also. You can do it for your domestic uh, one at home as well. So we'd now define second law efficiency as our actual performance divided by our Carnot performance. And we'll note that the heat engine will always be less than Carnot. Refrigerator always be less than Carnot. Heat pump always less than Carnot. Um, there's a bunch of exercises in RISAL that basically say, someone comes to you and says, they've got this temperature difference and they want to get this much work out per cycle. Is this possible? And you, just, you do the Carnot calculation and you say, no, they don't know what they're talking about, or yes, it's possible. And I think the PSS um, has some questions about that as well. So it says, is this possible? Well, we say, if it's less than Carnot, it's possible, um, and we can work out the ratio. If it's getting better performance than the Carnot cycle would get, it's not possible um, at all. So we've done Carnot for heat engine. I just wanted to point out that it also exists for the refrigerator and the heat pump case. Are there any questions or thoughts from any of that? No worries. 
Let's take a break and then we'll go to our first cycle, the spark ignition engine cycle. Thanks guys, I'll see you in 10, 10 minutes, five past. <laughs>